such a big audience today um, okay, and okay. especially people from uh, come from a lot of different places which of course means that wherever you are we acknowledge that we are all on Aboriginal land and we pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Before I introduce our speaker, Bruce Watson, I want to remind you all to please mute your sound. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please write it in the chat, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're on a tablet or phone, by clicking on the three dots in the, in the top or bottom right-hand corner. You can write in the chat at any time and I will make a note of your question and comment and raise it after Bruce's talk. You may not all get a chance to speak because there's so many of you, but we will do our best. Bruce Watson is a musician, songwriter and researcher and a member of the committee of the Melbourne Friends of the Film and Sound Archive. He'll be talking about some of Australia's earliest sound recordings and the last and only recordings of Tasmanian Indigenous language. Thank you, Bruce. Welcome. Thanks, Glenda. And uh, thanks for that welcome. And welcome to everybody here from, from all over the country. And there is somebody that um, has registered from Alaska, but I'm not sure that he's actually uh, here at this stage. Um, but anyway, um, welcome wherever you are. Um, the timing of this, oh, and if you're not on mute yet, and that includes you, Chris, <laughs> uh, who is our host. Um, In other words. Please mute yourselves. Um, so the timing of this talk is actually incredibly appropriate because just in this last week, the two Tasmanian organisations most closely connected with this story, which is the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery and the Royal Society of Tasmania, they both officially apologised for stealing Aboriginal cultural artefacts, including human remains. So that step obviously came way, way too late, but it came and it's, it's, um, it's an excellent thing. So, the specific cultural artefacts that I'm going to be talking about today uh, relate to oral culture and uh, thankfully they were given freely and generously. But of course that did happen in the context of cultural and physical genocide. I want to thank the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery for their assistance with my research and also the Tasmanian Aboriginal Corporation and the Southeast Tasmanian Aboriginal Corporation uh, who both kindly gave me their blessing to, to use the recordings of Fanny Cochran Smith. So I'm just going to start by showing you um, a wax cylinder. So this is in a, this is a commercial one, which is in a little pack. Um, you open it up and out comes the wax cylinder. It was like the USB of its day. Uh, you can see it's a bit like a record looked. I mean, it's cylindrical, but it's got the little grooves in it. Um, two minutes of audio here, and uh, in some cases, incredibly valuable. In the case of this particular one, not incredibly valuable. It's got um, a quartet playing Shall We Gather at the River, which um, was actually one of, the, my, one of the songs that my father used to sing a lot. So that was sort of nice for me, but um, not particularly significant. Um, as we go, as I share my screen and, and we go into the 21st century technology, I'm going to have to just make a disclaimer. It may not all sound or look as good as it should because that sort of depends on my, um, my internet connection and your internet connection and whether everything's all working okay. And we know sometimes sound goes a bit wonky and it slows down and catches up and everything. But anyway, um, it is what it is and uh, it will be recorded, it is being recorded, so um, you, if, um, hopefully the recording will be of um, better quality if you're not getting a connection. Anyway, um, so just bear with me for a moment and I will share my screen. There we go. This photo, as a young child, I was fascinated by this photo. We had it in a shoebox of old pictures, and which also contained stereoscope images. And I don't know if any of you remember stereoscope images. I used to love looking at them through the viewer. You got, yeah, you got um, 3D. Um, but I used to lie on my stomach on the floor 
and sift through the, the photos again and again. And this is the one that particularly grabbed me. It shows, as you can see, an elderly, dignified Aboriginal woman sitting in a la uh, singing into a large brass horn attached to an Edison phonograph. Meanwhile, a distinguished gentleman dusts the loose wax off the cylinder with a fine brush. And a little detail that I really love is the improvised props at the bottom to level the table. The photo was taken on the 8th of October, 1903 at Barden Hall, which is in Sandy Bay, just uh, a suburb of Hobart. The woman is Fanny Cochrane Smith and the man is Horace Watson. So I looked at that photo as a, as a child, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I saw it actually in the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery in Hobart that I realized just how extraordinary the photo is. Tasmania's and Australia's history re reverberate through this picture. It encapsulates the story of cultural contact, genocide, reconciliation, tradition and modernity. And it captures the act of folklore collection at its most poignant. These are the only recordings of Tasmanian Indigenous language. The National Film and Sound Archives website says, and I quote, the photograph of Fanny Cochran Smith singing into the bell of a phonograph machine operated by Horace Watson is among the most striking in Australia's audiovisual history. So what I'm gonna tell is the story of this photo and how it came about and the lives and the legacy of these two people. So let's start with Fanny Cochran. She was born in December 1834 in Waibalena, which was a settlement established that year for Aboriginal Tasmanians on, on Flinders Island in Bass Strait. In the months prior to her birth, 130 or so original Tasmanians were persuaded to settle there by George Augustus Robinson, whose official title was Protector of Aborigines. This move freed up the convict colony freed the convict colony of, uh, of Van Diemen's land for settlement and allowed them to graze their sheep free from troublesome natives. And um, I would highly recommend Cassandra Pybus's recent book, Truganini, if you want to know more about the background as to how all of this came about. It's it's beautifully written book. The settlement at Waibalena was a forlorn place. The displaced Tasmanians died at an, an alarming rate there. They died from pneumonia and other diseases incubated in their cold, damp, dark stone cottages, which are really like prison cells. They also died because their culture had been decimated and their connection to country had been severed. There's um, accounts of them staring longingly across at the water to their home. Fanny Cochran was the first child born in Waibalina and that put her in a unique position. Growing up, she learned songs, stories and culture from different language groups across Tasmania. But of course her life wasn't easy. She was taken from her family at a very young age to live in various homes and institutions. For a time she was a maid in virtual slavery to a teacher of religion or catechist as his title was called Robert Clark. Um, and all reports are that he treated her absolutely appallingly. There was an official investigation into allegations of cruelty by Clark to children in his care. And that investigations report found at one point it says, and I quote, on several occasions, he chained and flogged Fanny Cochran. And interestingly, uh, Clark's wife gave Fanny her surname, Cochran, which was her own maiden name. So this is how she tells her story on the wax cylinder recorded in the session where the iconic, the iconic photo was taken. So I'm just going to play a little bit of the audio. You'll notice how she has to really shout down that horn, which is due to the nature of the recording process, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about later. So here's Fanny Cochran Smith herself. Thank <laughs> you. 
I think that's just so amazing hearing her talking like that uh, across time like that. Anyway, by the time Fanny Cochran reached her early teens, the population at Waibalana had plummeted from over 130 to less than 50. In 1847, those who survived were moved to Oyster Cove near Hobart. And that included Truganini, Fanny and her mother, Taganitara. In 1854, Fanny married William Smith, a relatively educated ex-convict who'd been transported for stealing a donkey. For some years, they ran a boarding house in Hobart before moving to Nichols Rivulet near Oyster Cove. Fanny raised her six boys and five girls in a simple wooden house. Two of their sons are in this photo. The family grew their own produce, but their income came from timber. Fanny worked in the bush splitting, splitting shingles and, and she carried them out herself. And she would walk 50 kilometres to Hobart for supplies. She was known for her generosity and for her culinary skills as well. She was proud of her Aboriginal heritage and she was also comfortable with European ways and she was well respected throughout the region. She would adorn her Edwardian dresses with traditional accessories, shell necklaces, feathers, animal furs. Her attire was, was a metaphor really for the way that she reconciled her traditional culture with Christianity and European culture. And she really was a bridge between the two cultures. In some ways she was reconciliation personified. So all through this time, um, Fanny kept close ties with her people including Truganini, who you see here. Truganini taught her bushcraft and she would go, they'd go fishing and hunting and collecting bush tucker and medicinal herbs together. When Truganini died in 1876, Fanny Cochran claimed to be the last Tasmanian. So this set off spurious studio scientific attempts to establish if this really was the case or whether she was in the language of the day, a half caste. Scientists took samples of her hair, examined photographs and took facial measurements. The community was, uh, was, was bitterly divided. Contemporary witnesses and Fanny's mother and Fanny herself said that her father was Aboriginal and you heard her in that extract before uh, refer to her father, uh, Nuna. Others argued that, that he was a white sealer or a whaler. So although in popular consciousness, Truganini was, and by some still is, thought of as the last Tasmanian, uh, Fanny Cochran Smith disputed that. And in fact, the Tasmanian government controversially granted her a life pension of 50 pounds and full title to 300 acres of land at Nichols Rivulet in recognition of her status. Maybe this was from a sense of guilt. It's hard to know. With Truganini gone, most white Tasmanians felt that the Aboriginal problem was now solved, no longer an issue. And that the, and that the books could be closed on this shameful chapter of our history. Of course, today we understand Aboriginal, Aboriginality to reside in identity and community acceptance, and not just in DNA 
But back then, Europeans conceived Aboriginality very differently. And that was the thinking that was behind the concept of breeding out Aboriginality, as it was called, and the underlying rationale for the stolen generations. And another little book I'd like to recommend here um, is Henry Reynolds' uh, recent book called Nowhere People, which is on this issue of, of, um, of mixed race uh, politics and, um, and life in Australia. Nowhere People, it's a fabulous book. Anyway, today, around 20,000, 23,000 people, I should say, identify as Aboriginal Tasmanians, according to the 2016 census. And that number's growing. So I'm sure we'll find in the 2021 census that it's quite a bit larger than that. As a convert to Methodism, Fanny donated some of her land for the building of a church, this church here. This act of generosity was a rare case of an Aboriginal person giving land to whites rather than having it taken from them. In her later years, she was conscious that she was the last person on earth who knew the language, songs and stories of her people. A situation that has played itself out across Australia again and again in the decades since and continues to this day. Her response was to share her culture by giving recitals. Here's an ad for one of those recitals from the Hobart Mercury on the 26th of October, 1899. And I'll give you a moment to read it. I find the last sentence in particular is very chilling and it would have been absolutely true if not for these recordings. Okay, now let's move to the man in the photo. And uh, in this particular photo here, here's the third from the left at the back. Horace Watson was born in 1862 in Bendigo to parents who migrated from England in the 1850s. He became a pharmacist. He married Louisa Keane, who's second from the left at the front in the black dress there. Now, Louisa Keane was the daughter of the man who invented Keane's curry. And that was in Kingston, which is also near Hobart, uh, around 1860. And by the way, Keane's curry has no connection or had no connection with Keane's mustard of London. Louisa had been briefly married to a wealthy and much older man. And she and Horace shared her inherited mansion, Barton Hall in Sandy Bay. It's hard to imagine a life more different to that of young Fanny Cochran in Waibalina. Anyway, Horace took over the curry business and he made a major success of it. This photo here is the only surviving evidence of Barton Hall, the curry house out the back where Horace would mix the curry ingredients. And um, this uh, coming up is another view of the curry house. And we actually think that the curry house was the backdrop for the photo in the recording session. Well, Horace was quite the entrepreneur. One of his marketing strategies was to purchase land in the foothills of Mount Wellington. And one night he arranged the rocks on the property and painted them white. And in the morning, Hobart woke up to this site, 15 metre high letters saying Keen's Curry. This early form of billboard was certainly uh, something that generated a lot of publicity and controversy. There were threats of injunctions by those that felt that it defaced their city. Watson defended his right to advertise on his own property and he won. The question was even debated in Parliament. Being close to the University of Tasmania, from very early on, the sign was periodically rearranged by larrikins to comment on the politics of the day. Um, Hell's Curse, Fred's Folly, No Dams. And the first time I saw the sign, it said Guns Lie in reference to the logging company. And the sign is still there to this day. And if you're ever in Hobart, uh, you can see it ahead of you if you're ahead of you on the left as you, as you head up Macquarie Street into Cascade Street, a little bit before the female factory and the Cascade Brewery. After years of hard work, 
Horace found time to devote to broader interests and interests of a very eclectic nature. He established a girl's prize for science. He traveled widely and he amassed an impressive collection of Aboriginal and Pacific Island artifacts. He was also the first person in Tasmania to extract eggs from a platypus. It was a bit of an all rounder really. Anyway, now our two stories come together because one evening Horace attended Fanny Cochran Smith's concert of traditional songs and stories. And he was so impressed and conscious of the historical moment that he decided to make phonograph recordings of the songs. There were two recording sessions, the first of which was made in the rooms of the Royal Society in Hobart in 1899. And that was followed four years later in 1903 by the session at Barton Hall, where the photo at the center of this talk was taken. The wax cylinder technology uh, was, was very new at this time. And um, uh, this particular use of, of that technology, of audio technology, using recording equipment for documentary purposes was, um, was a very new thing. And this particular um, example is one of the first examples around the world. There were some done in America um, this predated the work, probably better known work, of Percy Granger. Um, so the wax cylinders in the photo uh, were cut by a needle which was attached directly to the brass horn to receive the sound. Now I've got a short video that I've um, taken off YouTube uh, that explains how the recording process and then the playback process actually work with the wax cylinders. So let's just sit back and watch for a moment. If you're speaking to here, the, uh, the variations in air pressure which constitute your fine, resonant, baritone voice will, uh, will pass down this horn and they'll actually the pressure increases as you get to the end. Um, and that increased pressure actually works on a tiny little diaphragm here, like, a little, uh, uh, like the skin on a drum, uh, which is actually made out of very thin glass. And that's connected to a stylus, which actually cuts a continuous groove in the, as a spiral in the surface of this cylinder. Now, the voice is now moving the diaphragm, which means that the groove changes depth according to the, word, according to the way that you've spoken. Um, so the louder you speak, the louder it is. There's no amplification at all. So you need, to, to make this work, you need to put a certain amount of energy in at that end. So this machine, um, there's another one of these diaphragms in the bottom here, and there's a, a rounded stylus on here which tracks in the groove and transmits the vibration of the groove onto the diaphragm. Now the diaphragm itself wouldn't be loud enough uh, to hear in the room, and once again we need to do the reverse of what we're doing on the recording machine. We use a horn of a slightly different shape which um, then amplifies the sound back into the room. So um, it's interesting that the, the needle goes up and down, unlike the, um, the old vinyl, or in fact the new, um, very trendy vinyl uh, records where the, the needle goes from side to side to make the sound. And what you just heard there is, is the sort of thing that most cylinders contain, like the one I've got as well, popular and classical music. Um, but thank goodness for those who thought to use this new technology to document important sounds. Anthropologists and ethnomusicologists have studied the melodic structure of Fanny Cochran Smith's songs in an effort to, uh, to understand Tasmania's prehistory and potential links to mainland cultures. Alice Moyle, who authored this article, transcribed the songs report, recorded by Fanny Cochran Smith as part of her research. Ha <laughs> 
Helpfully, as well as singing the songs, she provided English translations. In this next bit that I'm going to play, she translates the spring song. So despite the scratchiness of the recordings, the language and translations preserved in them effectively constitute a Rosetta Stone of Tasmanian language wow. and have been critical in enabling language reclamation. The recordings have been a, a primary source for the reconstruction of a Tasmanian language, which has occurred over recent years. And that language is called Palawakani. And despite the poignancy and historical importance of the recordings, there are strong signs that the session, recording session itself was fun. In 1909, H.B. Ritz wrote of Fanny Cochran Smith and Horace Watson that, quote, she was delighted to please him by singing two native songs with a phonograph. And Watson himself was clearly chuffed, saying that they had a real excellent time. This record was taken on October the 8th. It's interesting, the, the different sound quality of those two extracts is because they came from two different discs and each well, cylinder, sorry, each cylinder uh, has its own characteristics. So they're, they're made individually. Um, so what has happened since 1903? Well, for a start, if you visit the Tasmanian Museum in Hobart, you'll see an excellent exhibit illustrating traditional Tasmanian culture, craft work, and history. It's called, um, it's called uh, Ningina Tunapri, Ningina Tunapri, which means to share knowledge and understanding. Among the displays is a photo of the recording session, that photo, you can see that in the, in the towards the left there. And um, there's also a push button, which is actually a wax cylinder uh, in the foreground there. And when you press that, it plays the recordings. And if you visit the National Film and Sound Archives website, uh, you'll find these recordings as one of the Foundation Iconic Sounds of Australia collection uh, instituted in, in the first year. This was one of the initial sounds. Uh, it's been going since 2007 and along with Dad and Dave and Walsh and Matilda and the Easy Beats and Johnny O'Keefe and Gough Whitlam and so on and the Vegemite jingle, uh, you'll, you'll hear this recording. And it's a brilliant website, the Sounds of Australia website, and I highly recommend it. And in fact, the friends of the National Film and Sound Archives are going to be holding uh, an event on the Sounds of Australia next month. Uh, if you're in Canberra, you'll be able to go to that. And if you're not in Canberra, um, I think they're intending to, um, to stream it or at least record it. So um, if you're on the Friends of National Film and Sound Archives mailing list, you'll hear about that. And if you're not on the mailing list, we'll tell you later how you can get on it. Um, anyway, in 2010, the National Film and Sound Archives established the Cochrane Smith Award for Sound Heritage, which is awarded to, uh, for contributions to the preservation, survival and recognition of sound heritage. And in 2017, the, the recordings were added to the UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Register. 
The wax cylinders themselves are still held by the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, and the National Film and Sound Archive has provided specialist preservation and curatorial services. Now, what happened to Fanny Cochran Smith? Well, as I mentioned before, she gave birth to 11 children, whose children's children and children's grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on make up quite a significant proportion of Tasmania's Aboriginal population today. She died in 1905, so just a couple of years after these recordings were made. Uh, somebody not on mute there. We're, we're getting the wind blowing through, through our hair. Um, when she died, her funeral cortege was followed by more than 400 people. She was buried secretly to avoid the desecration that happened to so many of her people, including her friend and mentor, Truganini. The church built on her land at Nichols Rivulet was turned into a museum for her honor, in her honor. Horace Watson died in 1930. The recipe for Keen's curry, which had been passed down secretly for three generations, was eventually sold to Reckitt and Coleman, who are the makers of Keen's mustard because they didn't like Keen's Curry being owned by an independent company. But it's interesting that the independent origins of the two products can be seen in the different packaging. So if you've got Keen's Custard and Mustard, Custard, Custard? Uh, Curry and Mustard, and if you put them together, they don't make Custard. Um, but if you have them both in your pantry, take a, take a look and you'll see they're, they're different. The Curry House is all that remains of the stately mansion Barton Hall in Sandy Bay. But on the site, there now stands a McDonald's. Oh, goodness. So there's progress for you. Gosh. Now, the story of two more people around a century later. As a songwriter, I wanted to tell the story in song of these two people and this photo and what their lives and what this historical moment might mean to us. And I wanted also to capture the way that, that music can bridge the gulf between people and cultures, as this photo also captures. So I wrote and recorded a song in 1999, and I called it The Man and the Woman and the Edison Phonograph. I was greatly assisted by Tony Brown, who was at that point the cultural officer at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. And with his help, I received the blessing of key Tasmanian Aboriginal organisations to record the song and to use the archival recordings of Fanny and Horace in my own recording of the song. And I'm about to play that song and I'm playing it not out of vanity, but because it's critical to what comes next. There's a photo on a wall in a museum in Hobart. It was taken in October 1903 of a woman and a man with an Edison phonograph recording her songs of the land and the sea. There's a button on the wall there next to the photo. If you press it, you can hear the ghosts of her songs as they echo through the halls of that museum in Hobart. A scratchy reminder of all we've done wrong The man and the woman and the Edison phonograph Salvaging pieces of song White man's black cylinder, the story of progress The song lives on, but the singers are gone Not yet fifty years since white man first settled She was born on an island in Bass Strait's cruel seas Where the few who remained of her people were herded And left there to die of despair and disease And at seven she was taken from her mother and family To work as a servant and be taught about God But she still learned the old ways 
the songs and the stories And with all drug and mania She'd go bush for food And after drug and mania The scientist descended Was Fanny Smith now The last of her race The futile debates It seemed never ended As they took her dimensions And examined the shape of her face The man and the woman and the Edison phonograph salvaging pieces of song White man's black cylinder the story of progress the song lives on but the singers are gone And the man in the photo was born to an immigrant He married a woman of inherited wealth And he lived in a mansion overlooking the harbour Worked hard for their business, did well for himself And in time he became a gentleman of leisure Developed an interest Native folks' ways he collected and catalogued those cultural treasures archived and referenced for future display. He was a member of the Royal Society, propertied wealth, a man of propriety. She and her people were torn from their land. Betrayed, dislocated, dissected, according to plan But they came together through song pieces of song White man's black cylinder The story of progress The song lives on But the singers are gone There's a photo on a wall In a museum in Hobart It was taken in October Three of a man and a woman and an Edison phonograph recording her songs of the land and the sea. And the man had a son who in turn had a son who in turn had a son who was me. So for those who didn't get it, Horace Watson was my great grandfather, which is why I was looking at the photos, the photo uh, when I was a little kid. Well, I sang this song at the National Folk Festival in Canberra the following year, and Ron Brent, the CEO of the National Film and Sound Archive at the time, came up to me and he asked about the whereabouts and the condition of the wax cylinders, the, the subject of the song. So I told him that they were at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery, but also that I'd heard that there were some, I had heard some worrying stories about their condition. And eventually this led to a partnership between the archive and TMAG to preserve and advocate for the recordings. And then the next year, I was performing again at the National Folk Festival and a gentleman called Graham MacDonald, who was the festival's program director at the time, told me to look out for a musician called Ronnie Summers. Now, Ronnie was from Cape Barren Island 
which is next to Flinders Island. And he was playing in a band called the Island Coes. Ronnie was the main singer that was keeping the Cape Barren Island music traditions alive. And this was his signature song. I was born on old Cape Barren In them blue hills over there I was just a little baby When my dear old mama died I just love that voice. It turns out that Ronnie's great, great, great grandmother was Fanny Cochran Smith. So we met that weekend and it'd be a cliche to say the rest is history, but in fact, the rest is history repeating itself with a bit of a double twist and a half pike as well, as you will see. We became firm friends. And some years later, learning that we would both be at the National Folk Festival again, we decided to sing my song together. So at the 2005 festival, we adapted the words of the song to sing it as a duet and performed it there several times, including at the final concert before an audience of around 4,000 people. I sang the verses about Horace, Ronnie sang the verses about Fanny, and we sang the choruses together. And we finished it like, I'm just about to play you a recording of, but it's not of the act, that actual performance because that wasn't recorded, but another one a few years later. But this is how we finished the song. And a man had a son, who in turn had a son, who in turn had a son, who was me. And the woman had a son, who in turn had a daughter, who in turn had a son, who in turn had a son, and the next one was me. Still gives me goosebumps. Ronnie says in his book, and here it is, and please buy it. Um, he says, it was the most overwhelming thing I've ever done in my life when I sang the song with Bruce. I'll never go through something like that again, I don't reckon. And everybody heard it in my voice. And when I looked up and we was playing to thousands of people, and I reckon half of them was crying, and it made me worse. It was very emotional. There was a special feeling like a bonding among all those people. I know that I felt exactly the same way and the ovation and the emotional catharsis just powered over us as it has in a few subsequent performances that we've been lucky enough to do together over the years. And I want to thank, I think she's here, Erin uh, Collins, who helped make that possible some on, on more than one occasion uh, at the Signet Folk Festival in Tassie. One of my children has says that Ronnie, uh, said that Ronnie and I are related by song, which is a, a great little phrase that goes some way in capturing the magic of two, the two of us coming together around music, singing about our forebears doing the same thing, that is coming together around music more than a hundred years before. So the circle of history was completed when we recorded the song together with 21st century digital technology, of course, in 2009. But wait, there's more. In 2013, I managed to swing a regional arts grant to perform on Flinders Island, where Ronnie was living with his wife, Diane. Ronnie joined us as a special guest in the performance in Whitemark, just a few kilometers from Wybelina, where Fanny grew up. So that was a pretty moving thing to have happen. And in the words of Horace, we had a real excellent time. And Diane actually told us later that the performance opened quite a few eyes in Tasmania, uh, in, in Flinders Island, uh, where there's still a bit of racism. But wait, there's more. 
at the National Folk Festival the following year, I wandered into a demonstration by the National Film and Sound Archive showing how wax cylinder recording was done, how the recordings themselves were made. And it was hosted by none other than Graham MacDonald, the man who had put me in touch with Ronnie um, at that festival several years before. Graham was now working at the archive. Well, it was just another one of those magical things when Graham saw me and he asked me if I wanted to record a song. Well, did I? And was there any choice about what the song would be? So I quickly figured out a two minute version of the song so that it would fit onto a cylinder. And this is an edited version of that recording onto a cylinder. <laughs> this song was recorded by Bruce Watson on April the 18th, Exhibition Park, Canberra, Australian Capital Territory. There's a photo on a wall in a museum in Hobart, it was taken in October of 1903 of a man and a woman and an Edison phonograph recording her song of the land and the sea. And the man had a son, who in turn had a son, who in turn had a son, who was me. So you can hear from that recording how even a brand new recording with a wax cylinder has that thin, scratchy sound. But of course, the recordings of Fanny Cochran Smith uh, sound uh, even scratchier than that because every time they're played, that the soft wax deteriorates. And so obviously the preservation is a really big issue and duplication. Um, so there's nifty little machines uh, that, that can do this doing minimal damage but um, I understand that the um, uh, in earlier days some of the copying over of those cylinders onto um, um, shellac and then later vinyl uh, led to um, some damage they probably used too heavy a needle I've been told that damage has been done and can never be undone anyway um, that's sort of the end of the story so now the song about this 1903 wax cylinder recording has been sung together and digitally recorded by the musician descendants of Fanny and, and Horace. And the song about a wax cylinder recording has been recorded on wax cylinder. So that's, that's the story really. And I hope that I've, um, I've shown not just that this is an important story in Australia's history, but also that it, it's a very human story. And for me and others, it's a very personal story. But it's broader than that. I think it shows how critical sound preservation is to culture and to people. These wax cylinder recordings are the only recordings of Tasmanian language ever made. And they've been pivotal in reconstructing Palawakani, the revived Tasmanian language, which is in itself critical in reviving Tasmanian Aboriginal culture and increasing recognition of Aboriginal culture in Tasmania which of course was so close to having been wiped out. So it's a story of history, genocide, loss, so-called progress and technology. It's also a story of continuity, the passing down of knowledge against all odds, the importance of documenting and preserving sound, of cultural reclamation and reconciliation. And it's also a story of friendship and of the power of song. So that's the story. Thank you for listening. And um, we've got plenty of time for uh, questions and comments. So I'll stop sharing the screen now and we can open it up. Great. Thank you very much, Bruce. I can't tell you how impressed and moved I was by that, as I think everybody was judging by the comments that have come in. Um, many people have rung to say, you know, how it, um, it did, uh, they did react to the to the film. Um, the uh, I seem to have on his. I've got the the, the um, uh, there's there's some couple of messages here that we might 
ask the person to say a bit more about um where are we now um m pickery m pickery can you unmute just unmute yourself who says thank you bruce for this wonderful talk i was lucky enough to hear you and ronnie when you both appeared at the national folk festival and it was an unforgettable experience oh Anne, is it um yes. so can you yes okay can you unmute yourself yes can unmute. you ask to unmute yes please unmute well, I think you just remuted her. She'd unmuted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, what have we done? Well, can you unmute yourself? Ask to unmute. Well, unmute. What have we got? Yes. Here we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Yes. We can hear you. Right. We can hear. Right. I, I, I was really, I can count that as one of the special highlights of my life. That was the audience was so wrapped up and taken with the song and when it ended with both of you uh, announcing your ancestry and and you, the continuance of the song the, the atmosphere was I can't, electric's not quite the right word it was a lot more emotional than that but you could actually feel the whole room pulsing with the um the sadness of the story and the happiness of the story at the same time. That's beautifully put um, because, yeah, I mean, it is a terribly sad story and the story wouldn't exist if it wasn't for awful, awful things that were done as part of the colonization process. But um, there is also, you know, a glimmer of hope and of connection and reconciliation that comes through in the story as well. So thank um, Bruce, one of the uh, one of the other um, uh, comments in the chat room that we might ask her to say a little bit more about is Jenny um, Nathaniels. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but Jenny, who has done also done research on um, Tasmanian language, oh. and might want to share that uh, with all of us, and especially with yes, you. Hi. Hi. Um, I was. Uh, one of uh, I am a, a Monash pioneer, uh, having started at Monash in 1965, and um, as part of my well trajectory, I suppose is the only way I can put it is I did anthropology and studied the Aborigines in um, and it was in those days you had a major and a minor for your degree, and anthropology was my minor and linguistics was my major, and. Um, was a foundation um, member of the linguistics department. We had two Swedish teachers, Professor, um, uh, what was his name? I'm, I'm getting name freezes at my age, unfortunately. Uh, but Jan, Björn uh, Janet was the lecturer and Professor Hammerstrom was um, in charge. And there were just the two of them. Um, and they were very interested in Aboriginal language. And then subsequently, um, I think his name was John Platt, and he did a lot of research into Aboriginal language. But this was in my final year, we had to, we had to choose a research project. Um, and because I'd done, you know, anthropology, um, Aboriginal studies in anthropology, I decided on, on this, um, they found this, this tape recording of um, Aboriginal English, as, as they used to call it in those days, um, uh, of, uh, of, a, of, of it, was, it was to do with um, the language and I had to actually use a spectrogram, I remember, it was a long time ago, um, and um, it, was, it was just fascinating. I've always had a love of Indigenous people and in fact it was a dream of mine to do a PhD because there's a theory that where I come from, I was born in Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and there's a theory that um, the indigenous people of Ceylon, the Vedas, um, they're the ones that came over to Sri Lanka, to Australia. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very um, much. And I'm a PhD on this. Jen, do you so want to comment any more, Bruce? Oh, no, just, well, yes. you know, just to mention yes. that I majored in linguistics as well. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> Very strongly interest in language. Um, but um, no, that's, um, it's great. I, I know, um, you know, from my connection with the, the Melbourne University 
um, linguistics department that, um, you know, Aboriginal languages are becoming more and more of a focus of the work. And the important thing is that that work is being done more and more by Aboriginal academics. Yeah. Uh, that's, the, that's the big change that's been happening over the last generation. And that's, yes, that's the yes. critical change. Thank goodness, you know, they're being accepted at last. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, there's a few more comments on the chat room. Most of them are just congrats, congratulations. But I would like, particularly like to ask Jill Tumes, if Jill, if you could unmute yourself and say a few words, because you were talking about your father growing up on Flinders Island from 1906 to 1917. That would be really oh, wow. interesting to hear. Are you there, Jill? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Jill, do you want yeah, to say I was, a few words? I was just oh. um, excited. I, I saw this advertised and saw it was about the Edison machine. And I have a grandson called Edison. And so, um, so I wanted to show him. So that's what I've just been doing and saying, you know, this man, this is the man that you're named after, you know. And uh, anyway, but yes, but my father was born, born in Launceston, but grew up on Flinders Island. And uh, I've, yeah, had been tracing, you know, the ancestry and, and um, made connection with Flinders Island even just recently. So, um, it, yeah, so, so I was just thrilled to hear um, about the connection and then the concert in White Mark because all of those places were just so familiar to me from my father's stories and his um, memoirs that he wrote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I just saw a, thanks, thanks, Jill. I just saw a comment from Judy Jakes who's, um, who lives on Flinders Island and I just wonder if, You've obviously got your sound sorted out, Judy. If you just, uh, what if you want to make any comments about um, about life and race and culture on Flinders Island and the, maybe the Flinders Island Festival, that that would be really nice to hear hear about. You there, Judy? Are oh, you there, Judy? I can see you haven't got your video on, but I can see your name there. Yeah. So you can hear me now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not really prepared for saying it, oh. Bruce. I'm, I'm, I've just thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, and and um, you know, as some people know, it's something that if that history is um, is part of my um, great passion um, to do with the islands, to do with um, the history of uh, from of Aboriginal people, <clears throat> and uh, and and more to the point, Fatty Hopkins Smith, who uh, I was. Um, I was very, very, very honoured to uh, be given the blessing of the elders to actually record uh, the spring song, which um, is still an amazing piece of how did I do that? But look, you know, that's one thing. Um, yes, the Ferno Islands Festival is something that Sandra and I that came about through a, um, a museum um, e uh, exhibition that Sandro Donati and I put together which featured a really uh, mainly, um, well, a huge component of, uh, of Aboriginal history. And, um, and we were very proud to do that and featured beautiful um, Fanny Cochran Smith's uh, photographs beautifully reprinted <clears throat> um, in the wall, on the walls. And that started uh, the Ferno Islands Festival. So now what are we in? How many years later? <laughs> So, um, yes, uh, 2000 and, was it 2012 or something like that? Yes. So that, that's, still, that's still part of the, uh, of the calendar here on the island. And, um, and we're still here too, Bruce, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you, you better come over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just the disclaimer. We visited Judy and Sandro <laughs> um, yes. on a trip to... Um, to Flinders Island back seven or eight years ago now. Seven. That's fantastic, yeah. And uh, I also just want to acknowledge that um, you mentioned to me, Judy, in an email recently that um, that there was a, a tribute for a tribute concert for Ronnie. Um, I didn't mention in my presentation, but Ronnie Summers passed away very sadly uh, last year. Um, mm. It's an incredible loss for Tasmanian culture, but. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned that there was a tribute concert for him at this year's Ferno Festival or last year's. Well, it must have been this which, year. which was really yeah. probably the highlight, I, I think, for um, most um, Flinders Islanders. It was held at the 
um, Aboriginal uh, via the um, Flinders Island Aboriginal community um, grounds. And that was just superb, featuring Fred Pryback. Um, and uh, he, he did a wonderful, a wonderful show. I mean, not a show at all, a, a presentation. Very moving, just like your uh, presentation today. Thank you so much. Thanks. Fred, Fred played a lot with Ronnie. And um, yeah, yeah Aaron, Aaron, mid January uh, was, was the Ferno Festival, and um, yeah, yeah. Now, Diane um, said she was Ronnie's widow. Uh, said she was coming, but I I haven't seen her on the list of people, so maybe she didn't make it. But um, Diane has been a you know a huge um, uh, voice in um, in all of this story as well. I want to acknowledge. She has. That. Yes. Um, Bruce, I want to call in Jan Wazitsky, if I could. Jan, can you say a few words, because you've given us a, um, a, a good item on chat about, as you said, sadly, some of the racism still exists here. Can you unmute yourself, Jan, and say a few words? Jan, Jan. Jan, sorry. He's you just working out how to unmute himself. I can see yeah. <laughs> Am I there now? Yep, yeah, we got you now. Sorry to catch me lying in bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we can't see oh, anything except a pillow. Well, we all uh, know we all know that Tasmania is a very laid back state. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, I can't see myself, so I presume I'm on screen. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. Um, really amazing thing to happen over history, but also part of an individual artist's life. That's just great. It does strike me that you could tell the whole history of Tasmania through that story. And you did in a sense, you know, if you go into all of the, the surrounding history of, of Fanny Cochran, the Black Wars, Robinson's Line, how they got to Wybelina, mm -hmm. and your, for the, for the purpose of this, um, have to skirt over that for today, but, and also everybody that's here, we would have a, a reasonable um, working knowledge anyway of this, but it's so easy for us to forget that there's thousands of people actually don't have working knowledge of, of this history. And you're mentioning things that when you talk about Truganini and her journeying with uh, Robinson and, and the book by Cassandra Pybus, um, to go off into those stories and wrap up her Fanny Cochran's story and your grandfather's story and, I'm oh, sorry, great, great grandfather's story and, um, that history of, you know, particularly um, those scientists and people from the Royal Society um, feeling at liberty to take the human remains and do what they damn well liked with it, cutting them up, examining them, sending them to England, putting Truganini's bones on display against her wishes. Uh, it, it's the, the makings of um, a much broader canvas but you've got the personal story right up the middle. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, thanks very, very much. Um, I'm going to have to ask Chris Emery, who's uh, also hosted us in, um, how are we going for time, Chris? Um, do we have a bit of a time limit? You'll have to unmute yourself, Chris. Unmute yourself. Yeah. There's no time limit. Oh, okay. Well, um, I presume, uh, um, what do you think, Bruce? Well, we just keep going with any uh, We can certainly go on longer than this. I was envisioning we would yeah. probably go till about half past. Yeah, okay. Uh, and we can half stop past. before that if we run out of steam, yeah. but um, yeah. I think any longer than that and people will be wanting to go and get their Cups yes, of absolutely. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I'm looking at the, the chats, as I say, most of them are thanks and appreciation, um, um, Bruce. Is there anybody, though, who would like to, um, uh, to, to add a, you know, a special comment or question for today? 
if you can, it will give you a chance. Yes, Judy Wolf. Unmute yourself, Judy. I good. Bruce, is this session that we're hearing right now or your presentation being recorded? Ah, yes, it is. It is. Complete with little ding dings coming in <laughs> through it. But yeah, and it'll be um, everyone that registered will get an email about where it's going to be on the web somewhere <laughs> on YouTube, probably. Yeah. Uh, hey, anybody else? Yes, yes. Um, I do have. I do have a quick question, Bruce. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very moving. Um, endorsing the other comments you've already had, but I'm just curious to know where was the land that Fanny gave the actual church? Where was that? Yeah, that, that land, um, and, and it's still there, always was, <laughs> always will be. Um, that land is at Nichols Rivulet, which is a tiny little hamlet, uh, which is on the road between, um, between Signet and, um, and Kettering, uh, or Oyster Cove. So it's about, I think, seven Ks. Erin Collins, who I see there, um, she might be able to give more better directions, but basically it's, it's um, um, I think, about seven or eight Ks. It's in Tasmania proper. Oh, sorry, in Tasmania, yeah. south of okay. Hobart. Thank you. Thank you. Us OK, south of Hobart. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, little... thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Can I answer that, Bruce? And yes, I am here. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Um, there was a lovely event follow-up at Fanny Cochran Smith's church last year, um, CTAC, which is the South East Tasmanian Aboriginal Commission, a co coordin Corporation. Thank you. Um, started a new festival straight after Signet. It was only one or two events and um, called Balawini, and that sort of followed over from Signet with a lot of the Aboriginal musicians we had there this year. And there are obviously other descendants of Fanny Cochran Smith who are still here, like Rodney Dillon and um, Dwayne Everett Smith and um, somebody else I was thinking of. But um, after the Balawini event, which was held in Signet, they took a whole lot of people out to Fanny Cochran Smith's church two days later, which is, as you say, at Nichols Rivulet, um, just along the, uh, the, the road between Don Tricasto Channel and... Um, uh, the Huon Valley Basin or the Huon River and um, there was a truth-telling session there so you know it was I didn't make it to that I didn't make it to Balawini but the truth-telling session was apparently incredibly powerful so those stories are still coming out and I don't know you know if you saw my comment there too but you know sadly um, Traganini's um, memorial on Bruni Island was defaced just the other day so we're learning and we're unlearning and you know there's still a lot of work to do. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I did see that, that Jill pointed out that story to me. Yes, a, a stencil of Captain Cook put over. Yeah, I know. It's um, just pretty awesome. Amazing. Um, and Rodney Dillon, of course, spoke to that, um, thankfully, you know, to the main media, so hopefully. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Erin. Yes, I just want to make a comment of a slightly different kind. Uh, this is about the Edison photograph. Um, how marvellous to see all the stuff you showed us and told us about, Bruce. Fantastic. But one of the things that uh, I was also very interested, you mentioned Percy Granger, the uh, well-known composer, who was also, of course, a pioneer in the use of the Edison photograph, but unfortunately not in Australia, whether mm. of Indigenous or <laughs> non-Indigenous people. He did no recording at all in Australia. His recording was all in, um, on, on the uh, wax cylinders, was all in either Britain or and uh, the UK rather, or in Scandinavia. And um, anyway, that's just a, just a, 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 a rueful thought. If, uh, you know, if he had come and done some recording here, what other amazing recordings we might have had. Yeah, yeah. No, I had to come out to the Granger, I to the Granger. The, uh, the, the fascinating thing about Granger is he, is he visited and played piano in all those little country towns all over Australia at the time. And it's just, it's just astounding that he didn't think Australia was worthy ground for collecting folk songs or yeah. like that. It was just, just a shame, a big shame. Well, yeah, I mean, it really, it, it just shows how, um, you know, mainstream Australian culture at the time and to a lesser extent, but still was, you know, focused towards Britain. Australians thought of themselves as British and Britain was the home of 
of white culture and uh, Aboriginal culture wasn't seen as culture. It was, you know, it was it was still very much like when you read colonial texts about you know, descriptions of, you know, terra nullius, etc. And that was still still something going on. And you know, even, you know, the um, uh, the Royal Society, as as Jan pointed out, and all those, the, the and and Horace Watson and so on. It was a you know, it was something about curiosity of capturing something before it disappeared, which is great. And the Aboriginal community today is very, very glad that that's happened because of what they've been able to do with that resource. But, you know, the motive for that resource, uh, for gathering that resource was pretty horrific, really, you know, capture something before it totally disappears when we've made it disappear, you know, uh, and the language in that little ad that I showed for the concert, you know, it's, it's, it's chilling. And this is our culture um, only a couple of generations ago, you know, it, um, and so yeah, Percy Granger's attitude isn't, isn't surprising really, he was just, that's, that was the attitude of the day. I mean, I guess when I talk about, mm. you know, having a real, real good time, uh, or what, whatever the phrase was that Horace used, that's part of me sort of justifying <laughs> historically that there was there appears to have been a good and productive and cooperative relationship between those two. And, and all the indications are that that was true, but I, I cannot for one moment deny the cultural context with, with, in which all of that happened. And it was, it was terrible, mm. shameful. Can I just, it can is. I speak? Yes, please. My, my name's Ken Mansell. I'm Dorothea's iPad, because Dorothea is my partner. Um, I just wanted to throw in, I read recently that Cecil Sharp, the very famous collector of English folk song and also of Appalachian folk song, uh, started to use the phonograph, the Edison phonograph, when it first became available to him, but found that it put off some of his uh, interviewees. They were frightened of the actual machine and its elaborate nature. Yeah. And so in the end, he decided to ditch it and to, to notate by hand the many hundreds, of, in fact, thousands of folk songs that he recorded in a you know, by hand rather than by the phonograph. So it's interesting that Fanny showed no fear apparently for the this elaborate machine, whereas some of Sharp's was, uh, interviewees in England, in fact, were scared stiff of it. Mm. Yeah. They tell us something more about Cecil Sharp and his <laughs> techniques, perhaps, rather than Ken, rather than um, <laughs> rather than about um, uh, the singers. Who knows? And yet, for uh, John Meredith, it was the other way around. He'd, he'd spent half a day trying to trying to notate the songs that were being sung, and then in the end, you know, invested in an extremely expensive uh, recording device and microphones, and carrying a really heavy stuff on his bicycle when he went out. So it was, it's interesting. That was obviously a good time later. Percy Jones, 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 the Reverend Percy Jones, who. Uh, you know, uh, recorded some of, uh, recorded by noting, by notation, some of the very first of the folk songs that we got to know, like Click Go the Shears and so on. But he, he told me, I did an interview for the National Library with him some years ago. Um, and uh, anyway, he told me that uh, one of the problems that, particularly with one of his, he wrote, actually his main informant that he had, uh, every time he'd stop and hesitate, he'd have to go back to the beginning and start all over again. So given the, the time can, you know, can, yeah. uh, being used to, to notate these things, it, it was endlessly repeated over and over. So no matter what you do, you know, you've got troubles. <laughs> um, yeah. Can I just ask, I, um, and you can feel free to say no, but um, I'm wondering if uh, Ron Brent, whether you've got anything you want to um, put into this conversation. Hi. Hi, Bruce. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ron. I don't want Hi, to put you on the spot if you don't want to chat. No, that's fine. And just to remind everybody else who probably missed the mention, I was the director of the National Film and Sound Archive when attending the National Folk Festival. I heard Bruce perform the song and was interested in the recording. After having heard the recording, I actually travelled down to Tasmania, uh, met uh, various people at uh, TMAG at the Tasman Manian Museum and Art Gallery and um, set up a more deliberate cooperation to ensure that uh, the uh, valuable materials and not just that recording but a large range of valuable materials of audiovisual uh, importance, the heritage importance, were properly preserved and that did lead to uh, strong cooperation 
Um, I sent a note through a, a little while ago saying that that actually in turn led us at the National Film and Sound Archive to be much more deliberate about our uh, cooperation with other institutions. We'd had a long uh, and proud record of helping other institutions such as the library, the gallery, the War Memorial um, and, and other organisations as well such as the ABC to help them preserve their audiovisual heritage. But what we did uh, following the the idea having been stirred up by Bruce's recording was to uh, be more deliberate about looking at other institutions, organisations, some quite small. I think one of the smallest was a, um, a community group in uh, Victoria who ran a jazz archive and working with all of them to assist them in uh, preserving their own uh, collections of heritage materials. And it followed uh, a different approach when the or uh, archive was set up. It initially, and I think very properly, focused on collecting materials, bringing them into the national collection. But it was an appropriate time later on to think more about getting that uh, heritage preserved, whether it was in our, our collection or not. And all of that flowed from basically hearing that, that one song. So the, the impact on Australia's <laughs> heritage goes a lot further than just protecting that song, uh, uh, protecting that uh, cylinder. It goes to having um, caused the archive to be more deliberate about helping other institutions, small institutions, protect their collections. Oh, I'm and glad I asked you to speak, Ron, because I wasn't aware of that. Um, so, <laughs> fantastic, Ron, to hear that. That's a gold star for you, Bruce. Well, it's great for Not a, a song. gold star. It, it's great. It's incredible for a songwriter to hear that. You know, usually you, you write your songs and um, they go into the ether, or which is often nowhere. <laughs> Um, but to know that there's been some sort of, um, you know, real effect of a song is um, incredibly gratifying. So thanks for sharing that, Ron. I'm really glad I asked. Okay. Well, I think we're nearly near our closing time. Is there anybody else who'd like to have a word before, uh, before I make a final thank you? Can I just say one more thing that I just saw Jill's comment? Um, uh, th there's an interesting conversation that I'm having at the moment with um, with Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery about some other recordings that uh, that Horace Watson made, which were private recordings of little of house house parties, house concert parties, with oh. with Horace playing the banjo amongst other things, and them singing little ditties. Now they've been transcribed, but they're not available. Uh, they need to be digitally copied, you know, in a skillful way. And um, we're, we're trying to make that happen, but um, uh, budget seems to be a bit of an issue uh, as, as, as ever. But anyway, there's a lot of, there, that's a part of a way of saying there's a lot more um, of these sorts of resources that are out there that aren't in any accessible way, in, uh, that, that are in a collection, but they're not accessible to the public in any way. And I think that's gotta be, you know, one of the big tasks of, of museums and archives in the 21st century. You just having mentioned the word house parties reminds me of the uh, house parties in Darwin in, uh, in pre sort of Cyclone Tracy days and early days in Darwin, enormously important. In fact, I've just, uh, I've just listened to a song about house parties in Darwin on a recording that was sent to me by Carl Neuenfeldt, that wonderful ethnomusicologist from, who's actually now in Western Australia to my amazement, he's no longer up in Bundaberg. But uh, anyway, but that had a, I had a clue, it was his latest CD is Pearling Songs. And, uh, and one, there's one of them is about um, house parties in um, Darwin. And they certainly, uh, you know, I wonder if there's any recordings hanging around of those. Okay, well, no, no, sorry, yeah. just two, two, sorry. two chats that I've seen come yeah. up that I, I just want to address. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about the date of the, the concert. That was October um, 1899. Um, and the actual date, I think I did mention in my talk, but I, I can't find it, but it was October 1899. And the other question um, is, does the National Film and Sound Archive have contactless playing of cylinders? Well, this is something actually that Ron Brent showed me when he gave me a little tour of the archive some years ago. And they do have these beautifully counterweighted machines that mean that you need to have enough, it can't be contactless, um, 
uh, maybe one day there will be with lasers and maybe that's happened now but not to my knowledge but um, counterweighted machines so that there's just enough weight that the sound is reproduced but not so much that it, it causes any substantial damage to the machines but i'm sure that eventually there'll be uh, laser sort of technology if it's not already there um, but yeah I, ideally you just want to have these things played once and then <laughs> moved over to um, you know, uh, recorded digitally in that process, and then they never have to be played again. Yeah, and thank goodness the, the, the Film and Sound Archive did recently get some extra funding for the digital work, uh, which was great to hear. I think it's time we finished up. I've got to say personally how much I got out of that talk, Bruce, and I think everybody who was here did. The list of congratulatory messages on the... Uh, on the chat room is very very long and um uh it's it's absolutely fantastic i do want to thank you all for coming and for those who made the various contributions also to thank those who booked perhaps who maybe didn't make it today but uh, but also for those who very kindly added the voluntary donations which uh are very grateful given that we have no other sorts of buttons and it's so thank you very much for those donations so i think that's it um well we just finished now chris and bruce do you think say goodbye to everybody okay we'll say goodbye to everybody good okay all right bye everybody i'll let you all go home i'll let you all go home thanks bye everybody thank you bye 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 thanks bruce Awesome, Bruce.